welcome to the Focus on Goals podcast, where we provide inspiration for the next generation with your host, Angelo from SCS Sports Coaching Specialists and Lee from Happy Days Photography. Let's get into the show. So guys, welcome to our first ever podcast. Um, really excited about this one tonight. A uh, good friend of mine, Cole Dugard, um, obviously ex-Coast United legend. Um, so really, really appreciative of, of Cole coming on tonight. Um, the reasons behind us doing this, obviously, it's a bit of a crazy time for everyone at the moment. Um, spending a lot of time at home. I've had a little think and thought, you know, would, would adults and also children um, be interested in listening to uh, an ex-football player, um, especially someone like Cole, the sort of the ins and outs of, of professional football and his, um, him growing up as a young lad um, and the sacrifices he had to make. So it would just be a good chat, uh, nice and relaxed between me and Cole for everyone just to have a little listen. And hopefully you'll, uh, you'll get a real good insight into, into his life as a football player. Um, so I feel like we, we're ready to, to welcome Cole. Should just come on a screen in a moment. Yep. Hello, mate. You all right? Hello, Cole. You all right, bud? Yeah, all good. All good, mate. First of all, mate, thanks a lot for, for coming on tonight. Uh, it's our first ever podcast. Uh, it only seems right to obviously have yourself on it. Yeah, it's, uh, like you say, it's a, you know, just speaking. It's a mad times at the moment. And it's good to sort of get something going and, and speak to people. and it's, it's all part and parcel of it, really. How you been getting on at the moment? Like, what things you've been doing? Obviously, we're on lockdown. Uh, you're a sporty person, similar to myself. Uh, there's just nothing going on at the moment. Obviously, you just need to stay safe, safe and stay at home. What have you been doing? Yeah, I mean, it's, like you say, I think we've been lucky that the weather's been good. Um, you've been able to go outside in the garden and stuff. The kids have been out of play in the garden and things, which has been good. I think if the weather was bad, then it, it probably wouldn't be a bit more of a nightmare. But myself, I've been going for runs every day. Um, just probably fitter than I've ever been, if I'm honest. The amount of yeah. Running. So, yeah, it's, I think pretty much what everyone else is doing. Going for runs, keeping fit, doing, I mean, my culinary skills are, are going above and beyond at the moment. So, yeah, it's, it's not bad. Um, what I'd say is there's going to be such a mixture of, of people hopefully watching tonight. Um, I can imagine there's lots of Coach United fans watching. Um, obviously, you work for our SES Academy as one of the coaches. Um, a lot of the children. I always think it's great to to be coached by someone that's been there and done that. Um, and that's why I was so, so happy that you decided that you, you would do this tonight. Um, so I feel like it's probably best, first of all, just to, to start like from, from literally when you were younger. How did you manage to get into football? Was it your number one sport or was you...? No, uh, I'll be honest, I was about nine, ten years of age. Uh, obviously, I played football in the streets with a with all my mates up the street at the time. Um, I didn't play for a team. It got to a point where I was I was pretty, I was a hyperactive kid. Don't get me wrong, I, was, I, I like to get into a bit of mischief and stuff like that, but my mum decided to um, sort of take me to go and play for a team to sort of get rid of some energy, and that, that was pretty much what it was all about to start with. And then um, I went to play for a team called North Art Celtic in Hertfordshire, where I lived in Letchworth. And, yeah. Uh, all started there and then all the kids up the street ended up playing for the same team and uh, it just became like a Sunday league team obviously and then it sort of builds up and then when I got into secondary school it sort of got a bit more serious when I was there really and then you started playing for, I was playing for Stevenage Borough at the time, youth teams and uh, we was quite successful ironically. We actually played Colchester United in the final of the Essex, it would have been the Essex Essex Cup or something. Uh, oh, East Anglian Cup, sorry. Yeah. They coached United in the final. Uh, they beat us 1-0, actually. Uh, but then it just went from there, really. I was at Luton as a kid, um, got released by Luton. And then I played in a tournament for my county team against... Uh, it was a triangular tournament they called in. It was Norwich, Coast United, and my, my county team. And we played at... Um, it was Spring Lane at the time. It was a triangle. Yeah. After the game, a guy came up to me um, that played a big part in my my, my progress at Colchester United. Uh, Steve Dale, I think you probably know him as well, Angelo. Yeah. Um, and he said, "Can we have your number?" Blah blah blah. And I, I, at the time, I didn't know 
who Colchester United were. No disrespect, but I didn't know it yeah. was a team. We was Hertfordshire miles away, you know, so gave them the number. Uh, a few weeks later, they called me and I, I ended up playing a season for the under 15. So my dad was travelling from Hertfordshire to Colchester to play to play games in the under 15. So it's a massive commitment, not from yourself, but also from your parents as well. Um, you know, the, the, the travelling that parents have to do nowadays is, is, is crazy. But obviously, if you, if you want your son or your daughter to do well, you have to do it. Yeah, it's even more now. Uh, you know, the travelling's even more. They play tournaments here, there and everywhere. They go, they go abroad now, don't they? So, yeah. I mean, when, I, when my dad was travelling up to take me, we actually trained on a Friday night as well. So, okay. in school, <laughs> jumping in the car. I mean, the, the, A, the A120 it was literally one road then. So it was all the way, it used to take two hours to get up to the University of Essex and train for one hour on a Friday evening and then drive back. There was a few of us from that way that played for the 15s. Yeah. And, um, then you play on the Sunday. So it was, yeah, it was... It was so, so up the 15s, you had to drive two hours to get to a training session and play matches? Yeah, yeah. And and that's what my dad did. And he brought the other boys up as well. They sort of took it in turns, the parents whose boys were there. We had three or four of us from the play that was from sorry Hertfordshire that was playing at the time. Bought them and took it in turns each week to go. Yeah, um, yeah, it is a commitment, and it was, but it was worth it in the end. You know what I mean, but a yeah. lot of them, they make those commitments, they do all these miles, they put spend a lot of money, put a lot of money into it, and don't get anywhere, you know. So it's difficult. I think that's a that's such a good point from yourself about about the commitment parent because you could be the best 15 16 year old player but if your parents can't commit to taking you different places you know it, it can work out differently um it can work against you can't it you know the, the parents can't take you here there and if they've not they're not um financially they, they can't can't do it and yeah that, wrong my my parents weren't weren't rich or, or loaded with money or anything like that but yeah. they they found the found the money to to get me there because it was something that I, I wanted to do, and it's it wasn't it was what I wanted to do. It wasn't yeah. what they wanted me to do. You know, they they were just helping me along the way, which they have always done. Yeah. So so you're you're 15, 16. You've um, you know already been released by a club. I think it was Luton. Did you say? Luton. Yeah. Yeah. So Luton. How? What age was you when you got released by Luton? Uh, fourteen. So I think this is this is this is a really important point because obviously you know as well as I do. You know, lots of boys get released. We've had to release boys as well from from the academy ourselves. It's such a tough job. But how did you how did you react to that being released from Luton at, at 13, 14? How, how did you get on with that? Well, it obviously hurts as a kid. Uh, I had friends there that they, you know, so it was which hurt even more. Um, but I think when you're fourteen, you just want to be playing. You just want to enjoy it. And yeah, it does hurt, but. It, you can't let it affect you, you know, you want to you still love the game you, and, you, and you crack on and that's what you've got to do. I mean, we spoke about it before and, and it is a ruthless, ruthless in industry. I yeah. mean, they're getting released left, right and centre and it, it's, it is, but I don't think they, uh, football clubs prepare these kids for that. I, I really yeah. don't, they prepare them enough. Uh, when you go in as a 16 year old and you walk into a football club, I think, uh, I think the stats is something like, one percent of those kids will make it. Will be a pro, sorry. Uh, yeah. And out of that one percent, they they last eighteen months in the game, or it might even be lower now. Yeah. This was crazy, crazy stuff. So it's crazy stats. And you think of those millions of kids that are. I mean, you get kids now at, at football clubs, i.e., Colchester United, yeah. uh, going in youth team level. There's there's probably thirty kids there. Yeah. And maybe one's going to make it. You know, I mean, at somewhere like Colchester, they. They rely on their academy, so they bring probably bring more through. Oh, yeah. but, but there's more opportunities there now because you've got a development squad. You've got an under 23, so you've got you've got a lot of bodies there. So you could be at, at Colchester from the age of 16 to 23, and yeah. not get a sniff of the first team. Crazy, so different to when obviously we were there. And, uh, yeah. I mean, when I went there at 16, when I left school, you were 16 to 18. You, you was looking to be in the reserves by the end of your first year. Yeah. Look, and then in your second year, you wanted to be part of the first team squad, and that's what it was. You got yeah. taken pro to be in the first team. I mean, yeah. now they get taken on in a development squad, which is 
isn't a pro, you know, so it's the, the middle area which gives them more time to develop, i.e. called the development squad. Yeah. So there's, they're under the roof, they're under the, the club's umbrella for a longer period of time, whereas it was two years with us and it was either you're either going to get a pro yeah. or you're down the road. It's so, so, it's so, it's changed so much, isn't it? Because obviously, you know, I was a young apprentice at the time, you was a pro. Um, and it was just, you know, we used to make food for you guys um, at lunchtime. Um, we used to get right involved with you guys, but it looks like it's changed so much now um, where you've got so many different squads before you actually make it into the first team. Whereas before it was 16, 17, you break straight in if, if you were good enough. Well, yeah, like you just said, you make, you were making the food in it for us. You know, when, I, when I got there, we, was, we did all that. I, I used yeah. to put the first team kit. I'd be... I'd, we had the keys to the ground. Yeah. And me, a, a guy, Robert Bates, you know Batesy, obviously. Yeah. Um, me and him used to stay at the ground till about eight o'clock at night, cleaning the kit, the training yeah. kit for the next day. But we was yeah. left at the club. Yeah. Under the under a wooden stand, and we used to. Put, I mean, it's a silly yeah. story. We used to put each other in the dryer. Like <laughs> he'd get in a dryer and I'd put it on, and then yeah. I'd get in. <laughs> But it's, yeah. it's a wooden stand, and it's got. It's, it's so different now, isn't it? It's so different. Yeah. Well, I suppose um, you know things have to ha had to change, but oh, for, yeah. for myself and you, it's so good to you know, like you say, cleaning boots wasn't a chore. It was it was something that we wanted to do to clean one of the first team you know players' boots. It was exciting to do that. Uh, well, I think they still clean the boots. I think they still yeah. do that. Uh, I think that should still be there. Yeah, definitely. Like, it was great, you know, and at Christmas time they give you a little bonus and stuff like that. It's great, and that, that that's all part and parcel. I mean, when we went there, we painted the ground at the end of the season, we cleaned yeah. the stands, we did, <laughs> did everything. But, look, it made us what we were, and I wouldn't change it. I loved it, and, and it made us... It, we grew up, don't get me wrong. I left Hertfordshire when I was 16, moved into digs with four other lads, and my, my landlady gave me my key and said, there you go, get on with it. And it was like, wow, I'm 16. My mum's done everything for me for my for all my life. And then all of a sudden, here's your key, get on with it. And it was like, you had to grow up quickly, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, but now they're, they're, they're looked after a bit more. Obviously, they go there for breakfast at the football club. I mean, you've seen Coach United's training ground. It's second to none, really. <laughs> they're in. Um, they're treated like pros. That's yeah. what like they walk in, their kit's there, they put their kit on, they, they have their breakfast there, they finish training, they have lunch there, they'll probably go there and the youth team boys will probably go and have something to eat there before they play a game. So it, it's, it's, it, is, it is a lot different, but it's there, it's more concentrated, it's all about football, it's all about what they're yeah, performance. Yeah. So going back to yourself, um, obviously you're 16, you've just left school. How did you find out that you was going to get this scholarship? Because it's such a such an important time for all young academy students um, that when you when you're in year eleven school and then you get your scholarship, it's, it's such it's such a relief because your other option is to go to to college and you sort of think your dreams over. So how did it come about that you got this scholarship at college stuff? Well, I played like I say a full season with the fifteens, uh, and then they would make decisions on us for. For the, uh, to go and get your scholarship to your apprenticeship as it was then. Yeah. Um, I got a, I got a letter to say that they were taking me on, but um, must play the uh, coach of the time, Dick Bowley, yeah. and you um, I was spoken to him previously and he'd already let me know, but then we got the official letter to say that he was, oh, they was taking me on, which was great, like you say. And at school, I'll be honest, I didn't know what I was going to do uh, yeah. when I did my... Um, we went out. We went out. To, I went and worked in Burton's clothes shop. Yeah. Like when at school, it was like work experience, wasn't it? Yeah, work I, went, yeah. I went to Burton's clothes shop and I was yeah. packing the shelves and stuff like that. And then on the Saturday, they said to me like, "You, oh, you've got to come in Saturday." And I was like, "What? Yeah. I don't go to school on a Saturday, so I'm not coming in tomorrow." <laughs> <laughs> so that was like. I did that and then when the careers officer I spoke to the careers officer and they said to me oh, what would you like to do what are you looking to do what are you looking to go into before the GCSEs I said oh I'm going to be a footballer and they sort of laughed at me and I was like oh, no no but if you're not then what you've got I said, no I'm going to be a footballer and they again they were like what, no, but what would you like to do if you weren't a footballer I said, no, I'm <laughs> and it was a bit of a like, an argument they said well 
I said, look, I've got a two years apprenticeship at Colchester United and I'm going to be a footballer. And they were like, all right then, fair enough. They couldn't really say anything else to me. Yeah. So that was it, really. And then, obviously, it was then time to sort of up the Colchester. Um, it was strange, actually, because we all, everyone got sent a letter to say what day they was going back for pre-season. Yeah. I never received a letter. Really? I was, waiting, I was still waiting. Um, and my mum phoned the club up in the end and she was like, it's not right in. It's yeah. normally go back by time. Anyway, it was yeah. the second week in July, so my mum phoned the club up and they was like, oh, did we not send him a letter? We just thought he didn't turn up. They didn't bother to ring and see where I was. So, so you knew the right was on the ball there a little bit yourself. Yeah, I thought, sorry, sorry. <laughs> They're not yeah. looking for me to come through, are they? Yeah. But I, I mean, like I say, I turned up a week late and um, it was it was tough. Don't get me wrong, I, I turned up a week late and one lad had already left because he couldn't handle it. And it yeah. Because he was literally running every day. You didn't see a football and that, that old school pre-season. You got there, there yeah. you, you get up, you clean boots, you... you run you, and you just re ran till you couldn't run anymore. And that put that was what it was all about then, you know. Obviously yeah. changed a lot more now with the sports scientists and stuff like that for the for the better. Uh, but yeah, it, it was tough. So so you've had your um, you've got your scholarship, which is great. Obviously what was it like to, to your your first week, two weeks, you've got what, twenty twenty maybe scholars? How many how many scholars did you have? Ten to twenty yeah, it would have been twenty, yeah, eighteen to twenty. Yeah, so you've got twenty boys, sixteen to eighteen year olds. Um, that must have been such a such an enjoyment, most enjoyable time for you, just to be playing football every day with with obviously close friends. They would have probably become. Um, I think everyone will say that that's done it. You've done it. Yeah, they're the best two years of your life. Like yeah. you make it pro and you go on. The two years as an apprentice is like it's so it's so good. It's just. Like you say, 20 young lads, all under yeah. one roof. Yeah. Half of you were living in digs, so it was, you was going out all, you was going out together, yeah. you was going down together, you was living in each other's pockets and you become real good friends. And it is the best two years of your life. Playing football every day, it's like, it's brilliant. Even cleaning the stands and sweeping the stands down. You, you, you even had a laugh doing that, you know. Yeah. And you become real good friends. I still speak to a lot of them now. Uh, we've got our own WhatsApp group. I mean, you're in one of them as well. So we, we do have a laugh and it, it, it is good. But those two years are, even if you don't make it as a pro, it's fantastic. Yeah, good experience. Um, so you're in your two years scholarship. When did you first get your debut at Culture Star? Like, how did that come about? Did you finish the two years or was it? Was you already... No, I was, it was, I was 17 when I made my debut. Um, oh. We played... We played Hereford. We was going to Hereford away. Okay. And, uh, nice trip. Yeah. Uh, Hereford away. They always took an extra body on the on the coach to make teas and stuff on the road. Yeah. And I thought I was that extra body. Um, so I'm travelling up. I mean, Steve Fo a few of the lads had been before, and Steve Foley phoned me a couple of weeks beforehand and said, Adam, phone me up, checking if I was in on a Friday night. Yeah. And speak your mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, uh, he, he, a few of the other boys that I lived with were with the first team at the time, and he said, "Yeah, hurry, mate, you'll get your chance to blah 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 blah,", blah. Um, which was nice to hear because because he, he liked me. Um, and literally a couple of weeks later, like I say, I was travelling up to Hereford. I thought I was going to be number whatever it was at the time. I think I had three stubs at the time, so yeah, I thought I was going to no, not not even stub. And the manager obviously read the team out. Steve Wignall, it was at the time. Read the team out, read the subs, bet, subs, and and I was a sub. And I mean, I was over the moon. Couldn't believe it. Um, I think I got on. Uh, I think it was the same day. David Greg Gregory made his debut as well. Okay. The club. And then uh, a few weeks later, we played Torquay away. Actually, it was New Year's Eve. Torquay yeah. away. His day we was playing. Seventeen okay. uh, year old boy. Yeah, exactly. We travel up to Torquay. Obviously, all the hotels are Ramo. Um, we was in this pub stroke hotel. Yeah. It was. Um, I was rooming with, with Chrissy Fry at the time. I think I was, uh, again, I didn't think I was going to be part of the squad. I thought, just go in, just in case anyone was here or, or yeah. whatever. The manager let everyone have, have a drink and sing Old Lang Syme before a 
got four, went to bed. Yeah. Bed, yeah. Went to bed, got up, and I was in, uh, read the team out and the squad again, and I was in the squad. And um, I came on and I scored, which was really? unbelievable. Yeah, New Year's Day, I remember playing. I remember the goal, Mark Kinsella played me in. It was a left foot strike into the bottom right hand corner, talking away. So it was, um, yeah, brilliant. Amazing. So, so you was on the bench for that game. You come on. Yes. Yeah. So just, just for sort of the children that are watching this, even with the adults as well. So you're, you're sitting on the bench. The manager calls you over. You're standing there waiting to get on. How, how did that feel? What was the emotions going through your, through your head there? You must have been so nervous. It's nervous excitement, I think. Like talking about it now, just like the airs are stood on the back yeah. of the neck thinking about it. You know, especially the Torquay one. Because obviously, I scored. It was New Year's Day, and it, I don't know. It was just something a bit special about it. But when the manager calls you down, it's like you say, it's that nervous excitement. You want to get a touch of the ball. You're running around trying to get a touch of the ball, and he's probably bypassing you because you're probably running around too much. And yeah. Stuff. But you just want to get involved and. On my day, I can remember. I can remember everything, but I can't remember much of the game. But like I say, the, the four key game, I can remember it. Um, I think I got the equaliser to make it two-two, and then Simon Best, uh, we won three-two, and it was it was brilliant. It was fantastic. I bet the journey home was amazing to to know that you've worked hard all your life, um, and then suddenly you get that chance, which you know you, no one can ever take that back from you to to have your debut and to score. Um, it must have just literally been, it must have been amazing for yourself. A yeah, bit the, of relief probably as well. Yeah, the journey home was, I mean, the lads celebrated the new year in, I think, on the journey home. So, <laughs> plenty, there was plenty of time to um, have a few drinks, and, and the lads did, don't get me wrong, they did. And in them days, it, that bit, bit more culture, you know, that drinking culture on the bus and stuff. Yeah. Um, there was always a few uh, cases of beer under the bus. Well, we, I think they had used to buy them before we even got to the game. So, yeah, but that's how it was then. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, the hard work starts now. So, you, you've got your debut, you've managed to score, and now it's about really pushing on. Um, and, obviously, you, you turn into a, a massive Colster legend. Um, you know, you played a lot of seasons, done some amazing things at Colster, and ended up becoming a captain as well. I want to go on to the captaincy thing, because... Um, I think it was such a big achievement for yourself to become captain. Um, how, how did that come about? Did you get a phone call? Was it a train? Did the manager pull you? How, how did that happen? Funny enough, um, Scott, Scott, Scott Fitzgerald was captain at the time. Yeah. Um, Phil Parkinson had come in to be manager. Um, yes, I've been there a number of years. And if you ask any of my teammates, they would never have said that I'll be captain. <laughs> Andrew, okay. Yeah. You, what, you, what was that dude, sir? Um, because I was a bit of a joker, I liked to laugh, Yeah, I, I mucked about a lot and, and stuff like that. Um, I think the reason I was captain was because I led by example on the pitch, as in worked as hard as I possibly could and, and yeah. stuff like that. I think that's why I was captain. Uh, the, the talking side became more as I when I was captain. Yeah. But played in, I think it was... Um, John's Paint Trophy game or something like that, and it was away to Romford. Okay. And I remember being in the change room the day the day day before the game, and we was all getting changed uh, after training. And Scott, Fitz, Scott Fitzgerald wasn't going to play. The manager rested a few players at the time. He wanted to yeah. look at people because he was new. He was new at the club, and um, everyone was sort of saying, "Oh, who's going to be captain then?" Because obviously Scott's not there. Blah blah blah. And Alan White was there. Everyone was thinking Alan White was. And I was, the manager was actually in his room. And I said, well, I've got to be captain, innit? I? Because I've been here the long day. Yeah. Um, everyone knows me, blah, 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 blah. And I was like sort of shouting it up a bit so the manager could hear me in, the, in his room. Yeah. And funny enough, the next day he got captain me, whether he heard me shouting it out across the room yeah. or not, I don't know. <laughs> but it, yeah, I mean, I was captain there for a number of years, which was a great privilege, you know. I, and an honour to be, to be captain of the football club, to come through the youth and, and be captain and then captain us to the um, championship. Of, you know, I mean, the highest we've ever finished in the, in the club's history was, was amazing, you know. I mean, especially the season before we got promoted to the championship, I actually had a knee injury and I was out for 18 months. And yeah. I, thought, I, I thought my career was over, I thought I was done. 
um, and then to come back after that 18 months out and catching the team to to the championship was was unbelievable. Yeah, to have Coach United get promoted to the championship is is, is pretty remarkable when you think about it. Um, well, I mean, Phil Parkinson came to the football club and he, as soon as he walked in the football club, he said, I want to get promoted. Yeah. And we, we all sort of laughed because yeah. every other manager we had before that was like, right, we've got to get 52 points yes. to stay yeah. up. Honestly, yes. we get 52 points and then after that, see where we're at. But yeah. he, I mean, he said, I want to get promoted. And the lads sort of looked round and it was a different mindset. And to be yeah. fair to him, he was a great motivator and um, a real good man manager with the lads. And obviously, he got some great lads in, some really good footballers, and yeah. mixed it with some young, some young boys, and obviously the boys that had already been here, like himself, Ken Music, people like that. And he brought your experiences in, in people like Aidan Davidson, and, and, and your own signings of Mark Yates, and um, yeah, it's amazing, that, brilliant, like that. You know, it, it was it was a real good time to be at the football club. Yeah. So uh, a big thing I think we have to go into this is Layer Road. Because what a place Layer Road was. Obviously, um, you know, the new ground is amazing. Um, you know, beautiful playing surface. But for me, you can't beat Layer Road. A small ground, tight atmosphere. Probably was 5,000 there, even though they, they said there was three and a half there. Um, you know, what, what was it like playing at Layer Road? Did you enjoy it? Loved Layer Road. Absolutely loved it. Um, it was, like you say, it was an old school football ground. I mean, the ground now, it's a lovely ground. Don't get me wrong, it's a lovely yeah. ground. You're, you're 20 metres away from from the fans, you know. Yeah. Whereas Leia Road, you'd pick the ball up to take a throw in and you could, <laughs> you, could, you could have a bite of someone's burger. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Literally. So you had people like you're taking a throw and people are tapping you on the back. I loved it. I loved to be in the bar side. I loved playing yeah. down the side when I played um, on the wing or at ball back down that side. The pitch was always immaculate. I mean, yeah, when, we, when we played in the championship, it was probably one of the best pitches in the championship, you know. Yeah. I remember Sunderland coming down and Roy, I mean, <laughs> don't get me wrong, the changing rooms, you couldn't get anything in. Sunderland actually couldn't get all their, yeah. all their boxes in there of their boots and kit. And, that was tight in your way dressing room as well, wasn't it? To be fair, Roy Keane said, it's probably the best pitch you'll play. And he said, so that we're not going to use that as an excuse because we beat them on the day. But, I mean, Leia Road, you I loved it, absolutely loved it. It was, I mean, the last game there was obviously very emotional and it was my last game for Colchester at that time like when I moved on. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, I think uh, Durant Williams was very clever that day. Uh, he brought me off with about five or ten minutes to go and I think he did it on purpose. Uh, well, I know he did it on purpose to sort of get, get a clap and a, a sort yeah. of... And a nice base, yeah, a nice send-off. I mean... I think we both knew that I was going to move on that, that pre-season. I still had two years on my contract, but I think we both knew that I was going to move on. Um, but it was nice of him to bring me, take me off to for that, you know. The only thing I wish I'd have done, I, I, kept, I kept thinking about it before, the night before and stuff like that. I kept thinking, I wanted to, before I come off the pitch, I wanted to go and kiss the centre spot. Yeah, but I got halfway to the to the dugout and I thought I can't run back now. So I went on. <laughs> Too late. But I loved it. I loved the ground. It was fantastic. I mean, you, you drive past there now and you would thought it was there, you know. But it's, it's a shame that, that the club has to move on. It's got a fantastic facility now. Like I said, the training ground second to none. We didn't know where we was training from one day to another when we was at Lower Road. So, yeah. so um, obviously you left you left Colchester to go to Plymouth. Yeah. Um, your first day at Plymouth, how, how did that feel? Obviously, it's a whole new set of players. Um, you was obviously a well-known football player at the time. You knew you were going there to be a big part of what they were doing, their plans. How did that feel to go to somewhere new, a new environment for you? You must have been a little bit worried that, that was you were making the right decision. Yeah, it was. there was a, that worry, you know. Um, the day I left Colchester was, was an emotional time. Um, yeah. I remember going into the offices and speaking to Marie and stuff like that, and it, I was I was very emotional, you know, because I was thinking, am I doing the right thing? But always in the back of my mind, I didn't want to have that. I was thinking, what would have happened if I'd have gone somewhere else? You know, I yeah. wanted to try something else somewhere else. Couldn't get any fun way, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but what a fantastic football club! 
Did yeah. you move? Did the family move with you? Like, how yeah, did that yeah, straight down there. Um, yeah. We literally had Tilly. Tilly was born in the April, okay. and we moved down there in the July. So Great. we, we Great took everything down there in the July, obviously. Yeah. With baby stuff like that so we had no family down there to help out yeah. uh, we and when it first got there I mean they sent flowers they sent chocolates to the house to they really well like your family in yeah. um, they took the, the wives out for a meal so they all met each other and it was, oh, it was really good good club uh, the, the football club itself you realise how big it was I mean you went into town if you went into town yeah I had a Plymouth shirt on. You didn't see a Man United shirt. You didn't see a Tottenham yeah. shirt. You yeah. didn't see a Liverpool shirt. It was, it was Green Army. Do you know what I mean? You put in the advert, the Green Army. Yeah. And that's what it was. They were. It was all about that. Yeah. And it was a the ground, lovely ground. I mean, it's even better now. They've had a stand built. It's fantastic. The pitch was unbelievable. Um, I got there. On Adidas training kit. Like everything was spot on. It was there waiting for. All numbered up. It was a, it was a professional football club. Like yeah. I went I went from Colchester that was Leo Road, didn't know where yeah. he was training. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It was a total different outlook. And I got there. I thought, wow, I'm at a proper football club here, and it was a big big club. But it's down it that way, you know, sixteen thousand yeah. every week, every other week, which was unbelievable. And it was just. I really, I, I, when we did pre-season in Colchester, I was always one of the fittest, always at the front. And you know, I would, I got to Plymouth, and it was like these lads are fit boys. There were boys there. I mean, Jamie Mackey. I mean, a lot of you probably know him playing for QPR yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, one, probably the fittest boy I've ever ever seen. He was ridiculous. You know, he could run and run and run and run. Um, but it was like I say, it was a total different football club. Uh, fantastic. I love my three years there. We went through some difficult time, difficult time, sorry. Uh, we went into administration the last nine months I was there. We was in administration. We didn't get paid for nine months. It was it was tough times, but I enjoyed every minute there. It was a real, real good time. And also, you were captain at Plymouth, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So, that's a massive honour for you as well, to, to go from Colchester to captain And for me, that was a big step up to go to Plymouth. Massive club. And then to be asked to be captain there as well, that must have been a real proud moment. Yeah, it was. Again, like I say, we, we did pre-season. We went to uh, Sweden Sweden for pre-season, I think it was at the time, uh, which was great. Uh, I've, I've always been vocal. I've always been vocal when I've played anyway, whether it's yeah. people don't want to hear it or whatever. I've always been quite vocal. And um, the manager, I think he, sent, he saw that in the training sessions. And then he called me uh, before the first game of the season was against Wolves at home. And he told me I was going to be captain, which was fantastic. What an honour, you know, again, to go from another club, go to another club and be captain was was unbelievable. And it was, again, the first game against Wolves and Chris Luma had just signed for Wolves and George Elakobi had just signed for Wolves. And I was playing against these two guys that... Uh, played monsters. Against, yeah, two monsters, like you yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two great guys as well. Uh, but it was, yeah, another fantastic honour. So just before we move on about you going back to Colchester, just... Obviously, a lot of children are probably watching this. The sacrifices you had to make were, must have been massive. So, at 16, you had to leave to, to move to Colchester. Then you've done well at the football club. Then you've had to go and move to Plymouth. Um, another big fact about you as well is you don't drink any alcohol, which, for me, fair play to us. But to, to do that, especially around footballers and, and how social football is as well, is a, is a big credit to yourself. Because, obviously, with football, it does come... Hand in hand with football. Yeah, like I say, the, the, when I first came into it, the culture was it was a drinking culture. Yeah. Um, don't get me wrong, it probably still, they still drink now. Don't get me wrong, I'm not yeah. saying they don't drink and stuff like that. Yeah. It was a massive drinking culture. Um, people don't realise the sacrifice that football make. Uh, yeah. As in, you're training Christmas Day. For 20 years, I trained on Christmas Day. Yeah. You, know, you wake up kids want to open their presents and you're driving off to Colchester yeah. to train for an hour in the snow and yeah. because Christmas period is, is a massive period. I yeah. don't, people, footballers don't realise what sacrifices they make until yeah. they come out of the game. Yeah. 
you know your your, your family suffer they make sacrifices for you so yeah you, i mean you're traveling when i was at plymouth every other week you're traveling away you're staying in hotels yeah. you're traveling away every other week so i mean there's a way a lot when i was at plymouth because we were a million miles away from anyone yeah like you say your family sort of christmas time you New Year's Eve, you can't be going here, there, and everywhere. You can't be going out. So you've got a game New Year's Day, Christmas yeah. Day. You can't enjoy it as much as everyone else because you've got a game Boxing Day. Yeah. Um, don't these these boys that are playing at the top levels that are earning thousands and hundreds of yeah. thousands of pounds. Yeah. yeah, but they're still making sacrifices. You still, you still got family. You still got, you know, all those things that play a big part. And you. you People don't realise the sacrifices you make. But if you don't, if you want to be something, you have to make sacrifices. If you want to be successful in anything in life, you have to make sacrifices. Yeah, that's what I did. Um, it's a bit. It's, it's a selfish. It's a selfish industry as well. Yeah. But you want to be successful. If, if anyone that's successful in any industry again, there's yeah. that little selfishness, and, and I understand that. Um, I didn't drink. Um, I didn't like it as a kid. I didn't like the taste of it. And yeah. I, I hated the thought of being sick, if I'm honest. I think I probably got phobia of being sick, so that probably stopped me. Um, but I, I saw these players that I played with that could go out drinking and, and train the next day and be unbelievable. Yeah. To go out with them and, not, and get in at four in the morning. Yeah. And I, I felt terrible. And I think, he must feel so bad. Yeah, <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't technically as gifted as a lot of these other boys, um, and my game was more about the, the fitness side of it and and stuff like that. So I, for me, not to dream helped me, helped me yeah. be as fit as I am, and that's why I'm probably still quite fit, you know. Yeah, I think you know that that sacrifice you made is, was massive because, like you said, you you said yourself. That, that fitness was a big part of your game, and you knew that straight away. So you thought, you know what? I'm not going to drink. I'm going to sacrifice that part because I need to remain fit. That's one of my strongest points. Um, and it's it's important that kids sort of hear hear that from you. Um, that what you're good at, you need to really push and, and try and and well, try and. I'll be honest with you. I think that was the beauty of, of the the successful teams that I've played in. Yeah, uh, old Chester. Were any sorry, the, the players that I've played with knew their limits as players. Knew yeah. what, you know, we knew we had technically footballers in our team in, in yeah. some Kevin Watson. But yeah, what oh, isn't going to run like Kemi? Yeah, you know, yeah. and Kemi is it knew, knew what he was in the team for. Yeah, but he, people didn't realize how technically good Kemi was. Yeah, because what I was so yeah. Bad, yeah. Yeah. You know, his standards were so much higher, but, but Kemi won the ball back, but Kemi was actually very technically gifted, you know. Um, yeah. But I, I knew my limits as a player, and I knew what I had to do to be successful, and I knew that if I did what I what I have to do, well, that would help someone like uh, Greg Halford, or that would help uh, Mark Yates. Do you know what yeah. I mean? When I played fullback behind Yatesy, yeah. mate, Yatesy would, could win a game on his own, Yeah, you know. <laughs> But I, I played behind him, and I knew he won't <laughs> help help me very much that way. Yeah. I, I didn't mind that because I knew if I if I worked as hard as I could, he and and defended as hard as as, as well as I could, he would get the benefit of it going the other way. Yeah. And I think a big thing is everyone wants to be this footballer that can beat five players and like a Messi or a Ronaldo. Yeah. You need the other players as well. Hundred percent, hundred percent. You need them. Other look at. I mean, everyone. We talk about um, Jordan, Jordan Henderson. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Good example. Yeah. You know. So he's a player that. Look at the players he's got around. Him. Yeah. I mean, he's he's technically good. Don't get me wrong. He's technically good. You don't play at that level if you're not technically good. Exactly. No, you don't. You don't. Yeah. But he is the machine in there. Yeah. I mean, he is the the part that. The part in the machine that gets it all going, keeps it wins that ball back. He's that fire, you know. And you yeah. might know your limits as a footballer. You can improve on the things that you you're not so good at, but yeah. the things that you're very good at stay very good at or get back better at. Yeah. And, and the other stuff will come. Yeah, 
So, so obviously you finished your time at Plymouth, um, and then obviously went back to Colchester. Um, how, how was that? Was it a little bit different for you, or did you feel? Well, it, it, it was. Um, I spoke to Joey Dunn. I was waiting on phone calls from other football clubs at the time. Uh, yeah. That's about going into the pre-season and training and things. It was early pre-season. I spoke to Joe Dunn and I said, "Would I be able? No, I'm not asking. Would I be able to come in and do pre-season with you? That's all I want. To, I'm running around the streets. I said I just need to be in and around a changing room and with the ball and to do stuff like that. And he, he spoke to John Ward at the time, and they said I could go pre-season, which was was great. I wasn't looking for anything. No, I went in, trained with them. The first week I did. Went really well, trained twice again because I was fit enough, and I, I was up with the other, all the rest of them. Um, and then they went away to Holland for a week, and I spoke to Joe, and I said, Joe said, look, when we get back, if you're not training anywhere, John said you can come back and train with us after that. So I said, brilliant, excellent, no problem. So they've been to Holland. I did. I was doing my running around the streets. Um, they got back from Holland. I hadn't heard anything, so I'm thinking now. I need to start, you know, what's happening sort of thing. It's a tough time. I'd never been in that situation. Um, I was over 30 as well. Um, so what happened was I went back on the Monday to train with them, did the training session, and then Joey Dunn said to me, spoke to me after the training session, and like, we just spoke about football. And that was it. And then the next morning I walked into the ground, it was at Western Homes, and Joe said, oh, dude, the gaffer wants to speak to you. And I was like, oh, all right. I was like, oh, oh, everything all right? He said, yeah, he wants to offer you a deal. And I'm like, really? Because I didn't expect it. I wasn't, you know what I mean? I didn't think it was coming. Because uh, I, sorry, I've previously spoken to John and he said that they're not looking to bring in X, Y, Z. And I said, look, not a problem. I just need to try. Yeah. And then on, like, say, the Tuesday, he was offering me a contract. And, I mean, I, I ripped their hands off because it was, couldn't have been anything any better, you know? They're, if anyone else would have then phoned me that afternoon, I'd have said, not a chance, you know, it's the best scenario, best thing that could have happened. And I was, I was absolutely delighted. And it was, it was, it was all, uh, I don't know, it was something that... Is it like coming home for you? Yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. It was, it was amazing, you know, it was, and like I say, it did, it took me about four months to, to get a game note, to be honest with you. Like, like John had signed me and then I didn't play until, I think it was November time. Yeah. What's happening here? This, geez, this bloke signed me, and I'm not getting a seat. Yeah, it was really weird. It was really weird. I'd I'd come on a couple of times. I played a couple of pre-season games. Come on against Watford. I think I played against Ipswich and stuff like that. And then the first game of the season, Preston away. Uh, he took everyone again. He took an extra body. I'm, I'm now in my thirties. I'm thinking, well, I can't be the extra body to be sitting in the stands. Yeah. And he read the team out, read the squad out, and I weren't even a sub. I was like, really? yeah, it was like a bit of a bit of a shock to be yeah. honest, because a, an older pro taking them all that yeah, way, respect, yeah. you didn't think that it would happen. But I think he wanted me in and around the group at the time. I mean, because I was good in the group, I weren't. I'm not someone that's going to sit there and sulk and yeah. if I'm not in a squad. But um, yeah, so it was a bit odd, you know. And then that went on for for a few weeks, and then I was in the squad. I was a sub, and then I got on here, there, and and that was it. And then um, I think. Stephen Gillespie got suspended. Yeah. Thinking, well, if I don't play now, I'm yeah. never. Play. Um, <laughs> yeah. And we played, we actually played Hornchurch on the Wednesday reserves and uh, in the Essex Senior Cup. And I scored. And um, on the Friday, trained. And I was in the shape, the shape we did on the Friday. So the team Saturday, I played. We played Berry at home, started the game. And I scored two goals. So it went all right. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> so you got you got yourself back in the team. Um, obviously, like, I'm gonna I'm gonna read some facts out about Colchester, um, your time, and also Plymouth as well. So you made 600 appearances. There's two promotions for Colchester. Um, um, obviously, obviously in, um, culture to the third, well, three highest finishes in the club's history. Um, 52 goals, not too bad. Yeah. Some absolute crackers as well. I remember at Lair Road, um, and a 20 year playing career. You know, which is which is pretty amazing. Um, when when you finished playing um, and you went into into managing, did you realise how difficult it is to, to deal with players and and everything that comes with it? 
Well, I played, I played a little bit of non-league first. Obviously, I played for you at Stanway. Yeah. Which Good was, sign, man. I'll, I'll be honest with you, it was probably, like I say, the two years as an apprentice was yeah. two of the best years of your life. And yeah. I'll be honest with you, the season I had with you guys. Yeah. It was, I'd gone from being a professional footballer to, yeah. like, it was very intense, you, you know, and you you're always training, you're always getting ready to play a game and the games are, you love training every day, it's fantastic. Yeah. The games, there's pressure on you, there's pressure on your games, you know, but you're enjoying it, it's a, it's a nice pressure. Yeah. And then from that to, I remember you giving me the call to come and play for Stanway. Yeah. And, um, it was like going to play with your, play with all your mates again. Yeah. And how it was, I was so relaxed and I'll be honest, it was one of the most enjoyable year yeah. in foot ever had. Yeah. Because of the group of lads we had, again, it was like that old school football brown, like yeah. Lauer, that sort of feel. And I, honestly, I love the year I had with you guys was, was fantastic. We had a very good year. We had a good team. We yeah. had some great, and we had some real good laughs. Again, it was like old school on the bus on the way back after the game, doing donuts in Norwich United car park in the team <laughs> after we beat them. But yeah, look, it was a Real fantastic year, but yeah, I mean, going into management was, is, I mean, I, obviously I took over from yourself at Stanway for a few yeah. months, uh, which was tough because obviously you had a lot of boys there that were, were loyal yeah. to you and to move on, and, and I get that, I understand yeah. that, I was non-league foot, but I totally understand that, yeah. uh, and I was assistant to Kemi at the time at Stanway, uh, which was which was tough again because you're building a team and that non-league some week some lads don't turn up to training and stuff yeah. like that and it's difficult and then then I went over to Haybridge with uh, Jody and then Jody left after a, a few months and then obviously Julian Dix come in uh, which was I mean I don't I've never never met Julian before he took over at, at Haybridge and the football club well, he wanted to stay on with him and I yeah. said I would do but we've got to see if we we create we've got a bond because if we've not got a bond it's not going to be good for the football club so and it, we've got a, so well it's unbelievable I still speak to him now I mean he's, yeah. he's obviously gone up to West Brom now with, with Slav and Village uh, but real good guy loved him I, I can ring him now and ask ask him anything you know he, he's yeah. at the end of the front um, we had a fantastic year got to the playoffs uh, again, though, it's tough, you know. When you're assistant, it's easier. It's definitely yeah. easier. Uh, but he, he, he dealt with it fantastically well. Um, I did my bit as an assistant. We got to the playoffs, won the playoffs, and didn't go up because of the points per game thing and stuff like that. But that is, is. And then, obviously, Julian's gone up to West Brock. And then the uh, football club asked me to take over, which I, I said yes straight away. But because I knew the lads, I knew the club, I had a year with them. Yeah. where I knew a lot of them and I, I respected them and I felt that they respected me. So what we did, we done pre-season. Obviously, we've lost a lot of players. Don't get me wrong, we lost a lot of players. But, but fair play, I, I brought Nevs in, Stuart Nevercott as my assistant. Um, Bevo, you know, Bevo, the, the physio. Yeah. A goalie coach there that was always there. Um, Goody, we called him. He was there with um, Julian as well. And I brought Pulley in. Obviously, you know Pulley from Stanway. Yeah. Stanway done. And now we've got Ryan Hanley as well that's, that helps out. So we've got a good staff. We've got a good squad of staff, if you like. And I think that's important. Uh, they've been really important for me. They've helped me out no end. They all play a part. Um, it's, it's just that other side of it, isn't it? The guy and again, people, non league, I think. Hey Bridge, the boys are, are fantastic, as in um, very professional in the way they want to do things. Training wise, they're at it. Tuesdays, Thursdays, um, on a Saturday, they've been great for me. They give everything, and, and I can't, I can't speak of them highly enough. You know, they, yeah. they've really done a great job for me throughout the season, and I've got very good relationships with them all. Um, but we, we, we're in the playoffs as it stands. Obviously, the big yeah. up short because of because of all what's going on in the world at the moment. And rightly so. Uh, I agree with what they've done to the studio. I think, uh, I think it should be a straight right across the board. I think right across the world. I mean, yeah. look, we all know Liverpool at the top of the league, but I think they should avoid everything. It's not... Everyone's talking about it what now. What teams support, dudes? 
Sort of. Yeah, I thought you'd say that then. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I'll be honest with you, mate. I think, look, we, no, know, you're right. we know Liverpool are the best team. It's more important things, isn't it? Well, I think at this moment in time, I think I've read a thing from Lee Bowyer who's saying that just, I can't believe they're even thinking about starting again. Like, yeah. He's right across the world. Can you can you honestly see Italy start, restarting their league? Yeah, it's not happy, is it? Yeah. I, I just can't see it happening. And Look, it's just... It's, 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 it's a shame for Liverpool. I, I, don't think, it, I think it's it's a bigger thing than, than football. And but the football thing now, they're talking about starting it and playing it, playing ninety-two games in five weeks. Yeah. It's, it's, become, it's become about it's become about money now. It's not about the football. It's all about the money side of it, which I understand. The chairman want their money for the yeah, for yeah. rights and stuff like that, and yeah. like that, that. But I think they should just go right across the board, null and void. Because it's yeah. it's just when it starts again, it's just going to be a farce, I think. But yeah. I mean, yeah, you, like you were saying, sorry, we we went off there, but the, the management side of it is different, a lot different. Um, when I started my coaching badges, at Colchester Joey Dunn got me into that. He's he he got me into that. I probably should have done them earlier, but Joey like push put it on us. Me, I mean, we both did them together, uh, and it was. I'd never thought about it. I'd always used to say, I'll do it next year, I'll do it next year. And before I knew it, I'm 35. And yeah. then I'm doing it. So, and then I started doing it. And, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the coaching side. Um, I enjoyed being an assistant. Then you become a manager, and, and it is totally different. I mean, it is, it is a lot different. But like I say, I've got a real good squad of um, staff. We call it a squad of staff because there's a number of them with me that helped me along the way, and they've been fantastic. But I mean, this season we we got it because the lads have been unbelievable for me this season. And like I say, we we would have, we would have probably finished it in the playoffs, which which would have been nice. But like I say, we built we built a really strong team, a real strong group. And it's just a shame that we couldn't finish it off. Yeah. Just before we go into some, I'm going to basically have a look on the Facebook live chat and see. There's a few comments on there about questions. There's a few questions that people want to ask about about your career and different bits. Yeah. But just before we do that, I just want to go one point. I think this is important that we let children know that you know it's difficult to become a professional footballer. But the option of playing non-league football is is huge. Um, you know, like like playing for Stanway Rovers or or Haybridge, or, or you know playing in the conference. You, you know, you can earn a lot of money. You can enjoy your football. Um, some clubs in the non-league are full time as well. So. What's your take on that? Because obviously there's a lot of probably your friends that didn't quite make it. Well, I'll be honest, never, never give up that dream. You know? Never yeah. give it up. Yeah, there's, there is a club out there for you. Without a doubt, there's a club out there for you. Like you say, the non league it's great. I've loved it. It's, um, it's very old school. Like, like you yeah. look at the old school grounds like a layer road, and it reminds me of them times. And that's why yeah. I probably like it so much. <laughs> But it is difficult to become a professional footballer. Like I said, the, stats are, the, the, the odds are against you becoming a pro. Don't get me wrong. But you just work as hard as you possibly can. And, and, and who knows? You know, Don't put any pressure on yourselves. Don't let anyone put any pressure on you to do it because it becomes even more difficult. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there will be a club out there for you. Like you say, the non-league is great. There's players out there, people out there that are turning down contracts in because they've got fantastic jobs that they do and they can play on the um, very good money and yeah. and, it, and really enjoy it. there's no pressure on it I've, I've, I've seen a lot of my friends make a, make a good living out of non-league football and I'm yeah. seeing that now you know all the majority of the pros go into non-league and they love it of course they do yeah well boys that get released as well from, from professional clubs go into uh, to non-league circuit I think the big thing for me was is how good the standard is in the non-league, you know, you see it in the F FA Cup upsets, but people automatically think, oh, it's non-league, it's not not great, but you know as well as I do, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to stand it, even at the level of, like you say, the Stanway, the Haybridge, there is some yes. uh, talent out there. You probably don't give it the respect that it deserves. Yeah, don't give it the respect that they do. Um, I'm, I maybe probably would have been one of them when, when I first packed up. Yeah. I for you boys, it was like there's some good players here and, and even at that level, you know, Burlo yeah. Nut, you know, there's some good, good players and yeah. I think some fantastic players in, in our division, you know, it's, yeah. it's, there's some good clubs in there, 
obviously you've got Malden, look at Malden in the FA Cup last year. Unbelievable. You know, what an achievement for them, you know, they've done a fantastic job there, Brownie and Aves. Yeah. And it's, it, is, it is good, There's and more players are going to come out from the non-league, because you've got yeah. these young lads that don't quite make it, then they go yeah. into the non-league, then they get picked up again, and they get that second sort of wind, if you like, to go again. And yeah. I think you get more, look at Jamie Vardy, people like, I know we always say Jamie Vardy, but Amazing. Yeah, that, it's going to be more of them for sure. Yeah. All right, so I think we'll go on to some questions. Um, let me just have a look on, on here at the moment. I've seen one which I really like. Um, let's just have a look on here. So we've got our, our good friend Darren Maiden, um, yeah. Colchester fan through and through. And yeah, he's a very good player. Um, so the question is, what is the most memorable game you have played in a Colts United shirt. Tough one, man. God, there's a lot, a lot. Of I mean, your debut, I can't really remember much of it, so it couldn't be that. Um, obviously, my first goal, Torquay. Um, first time I walked him out against, as, as a captain at yeah. Rotherham. Um, but obviously, I think the big one everyone's probably expecting me to say would be the Ipswich game, scoring the winner against Ipswich on a Friday night at Low Road. What, yeah. more, what more do you want? You know, score the winner. Rocking. Yeah, it was. It was the atmosphere that night was unbelievable. I mean, someone, my, my chairman actually just sent me through a thing just before we come on here about the whole game when we beat them five one. Chris Ulumu scored four. That was a fantastic. Yeah. Look. I'd have to say the Ipswich game for Colchester for sure. Excellent, mate. Um, one of our academy as well. I'm just scrolling through because I did see it. Um, Harry Felton, who's uh, the striker at our academy, um, in your group as well, at the under 11s. Um, for a question, this is: uh, What was it like playing against Jack Wilshere? Funny enough, um, it was actually Jack's 17th birthday. Uh, yeah. I know Jack. I know Jack very well. Uh, yeah. He, he's, he's from Hart, he's from Hitchin in Hertfordshire. I'm from Letchworth. My dad actually played football with his dad uh, for really? many. Yeah, yeah. So, and I know Jack. I lived up when I lived in Hertfordshire. I lived up the same road as his parents, where he lived at the time. So, um, I had a conversation with Jack before he went to Arsenal because he was actually at Luton at the time. His parents actually asked me for a bit of advice um, whether he should go to Arsenal or stay at Luton. And I, all I said to him was. Leave him where he's enjoying the most and yeah. he, will, he will progress. If he's not enjoying it, he ain't got to progress. Yeah. And obviously, he went on to Arsenal and fantastic things. But yeah, he came on. It was Arsenal in the FA Cup for Plymouth. He, yeah. he came on as sub for, for Arsenal. And uh, like I say, I've got a fantastic frame and picture frame, a picture of me and him together. He's running at me, probably went past me. Uh, and I thought because we swapped shirts at the time, uh, I've got his shirt and I've got a Plymouth num my my shirt in the yeah. same frame and a picture of us and the captain's armband and the program and stuff. But yeah, it was fantastic to play against Jack. Like I say, because of the history and and what it was, he actually signed his contract that day, his first professional contract as well. So um, it was just nice to to play against because the history of between us as well. Dude, just on that point, um, what, just just quickly name a few of the other players that were playing in that game. I know me and you have a bit of banter about it. Um, when uh, was, was it the goal you scored or something? It was about marking. I think Van Persie was playing as well, weren't he? Well, Van Persie was marking me on the set play. That was it, yeah. yeah that free kick, uh, which David Gray, David Gray took. He um, swung, he went wide, and uh, obviously. Van Persie's meant to be obviously marking me. Yeah, good movement. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It was all about the movement, secondary movement. So <laughs> as it's gone wide, I've made my run into the box and the ball's come across and I've, I've finished it, left foot finish. And actually on the commentary, as you listen to it, on the commentary actually said Van, Van Persie's got to stay with his runner. And it's the best, it's the best thing you can oh. hear like, like me. But they had some unbelievable players playing that. Yeah. I mean, the RB, the RB was ridiculous. You had yeah. Nancy, Van Persie, um, Ramsey, Wilshire. I mean, when, when, when you played in that game against these players, were they as good as what you thought they was going to be? 
or yeah, yeah, yeah. they work? Was it difference in levels? Did it's, you think of this thing? Mate, it was ridiculous. Like, the first time I've ever got cramps. Yeah, really. Yeah. And really? they're chasing the Derby. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, he was unbelievable. He was a machine. I mean, yeah. you, you looked at him and when you look at what must be error when you play against someone like him, it was like, wow, this guy's an absolute machine. But they had a fantastic team out that day. And, I mean, I was marking Van Persie on for their goal when he scored from the corner, so I should attract him. I'm just scrolling down. Um, oh, this is a good one from uh, the G-Man. Um, we, we all know the G-Man. Um, is it a dream of yours, Cole, to be coach United manager one day? I've always said I would. I've always yeah. said I want to be. Um, it's got to be, isn't it? You've played there. Cool. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Look, I would love to be managed with Oxford United one day. Whether that happens or not, I don't know. But I'm, I'm sort of doing my apprenticeship in non league. Uh, they have coaches who have a way of promoting their managers through. Yeah. Um, John come through, uh, Joe came through, John McGrill, uh, sorry, and uh, Tony Humes at the time. So they've, they've progressed play, uh, managers through. Um, you're looking at probably Brownie, maybe the next one, if you like. Yep. If he, that's the way they're doing it, I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Look, I'd love to be part of that. And who knows? Like I say I've got to be. I'm doing my apprenticeship at the moment in non league so I've got to do that first. Yeah. Um, I've got a question for you. Um, Lamano Trizzle the one one. Um, what a player he was at Colchester. Um, was he probably the best player you played with at Colchester? I'm going to be controversial here. Um, okay. He's not the best player I've played with. Look, the mother was unbelievable, ridiculous talent. He didn't know what he was going to do next. <laughs> and, and that's true. He would say that, he would tell you that himself. I played in charity games with him and he's still the same now. You know? um, yeah. But he was ridiculous. He, he was a kid at the time, so he wasn't, I mean, then when he went on to Newcastle, he became a better footballer without a doubt. Like you watch yeah. him, and he became a better footballer. But he was, he was up there, don't get me wrong. Um, yeah. But he was very raw. He, he did things that, like I say, he didn't know. He didn't know he was going to do it. What he was going to do after time. Yeah. But great lad. Got on well with him. I mean, I played with obviously Mark Kinsella. What a footballer he was. Played for Ireland. Played in the World Cup. Um, but the best player that I played with at Colchester yeah. would have, was Steve Whitten. And, yeah. and I'm telling you now, this guy, technically. Unbelievable. Left yeah. foot, right foot. He could head it. He was horrible. <laughs> On the pitch, he could hurt someone, you know. He had everything. He, honestly, he did. And and I played with him at the end of his career. So, yeah. I, Actually, I, I think it was when um, he, honestly, he was he was so good. And yeah. we talk about the drinking culture and stuff like that. And he, he, was, he was one of those. But he could go out on a... On a Tuesday night, say we train on a Wednesday, and he would be the best player on the pitch. He was yeah. that. Really? Uh, I remember Grant Williams said to me at once. He said that he should have played for England if he would have. Really? Because because of the drinking side of it. Yeah. He, well, he would have played for England if 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 he didn't like the social side of it. Yeah. Well, that just shows it shows you, doesn't it? That sacrifice. Sometimes you got to do that. These top level players. Yeah. Oh, he had a fantastic career. Which yeah. had a fantastic career, and I respected him. Yeah. As a manager, he was fantastic for me. He played me. He was great for me. Yeah. Uh, and he, he was, he was the best player I played. And, and um, people are going to say, really? And I, I know a lot of Colchester fans will think that, but yeah. to, as a footballer, training, he was unreal. Yeah. Um. So we're coming to the end of this now. I just wanted to say as well. Just to, more so to our academy players at the SES Academy, um, what's the sort of three things, now you're a manager, what's the sort of three things that you look at at players if you wanted to recruit them for yourself, for, for Haybridge or, or at our academy? What would you be looking for? What's the three main things you'd be looking at? Well, obviously, for an academy player to a non-league player, it's, it's different. Yeah. You know, uh, a big thing for me is... is it's commitment. Yeah. Commitment to, to do, to want to do it. You know, they've got yeah. to be, they've got to want to do it. First, they've got to be able to, uh, you've got to be coachable. Yeah. And 
you got to be able to develop, help yeah. them develop. You know? um, in, with the kids, it's different. Like you say, you're looking at non-league. You sort of look at the background and and what yeah. they're like socially and stuff like that as well. Because yeah. they've got group and things yeah. like that. So, like the team Haybridge, I look at things because uh, you've got a really good group. Because all the teams I've played in, the group has been fantastic. Yeah. Like, successful in. Yeah. Uh, so, but the young boys, the, the ability, they've, got, they've yeah. all got ability. You've got that ability haven't you? Yeah. They've all, they've all got some sort of ability, don't get me yeah. wrong. Uh, and then, I mean, a lot of teams are different, aren't they? I remember I remember we played Blackburn in the FA Cup once and Sam Allardyce was saying, the first thing they look for is, is athleticism. That's yeah. the first thing they look for. Yeah. But you look at the teams that he had, yeah. uh, it was athleticism and then then it was the, the ability after. You know, after yeah. the ability. third thing at that time with the mad teams he was managing yeah, you you want to commit the players yeah. first and foremost. You want to to want to do it and, and stuff like that. But it's difficult. But if you've got a gen, a kid that is unbelievable, you're going wow, you know it, it's 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 all there, isn't it? But you've got to yeah. keep them on when they get to that age. You've got to keep them on the straight and narrow. That 15, 16 years of age, they yeah. go through that. They either go one way or the other. They Right, I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. do this career football, or I'm going to do something else. Do you know? Um, the same with myself. You, there's plenty of friends that you've probably got that, at ten years of age, twelve, were probably the best players around around your area. Um, but just because you're the best ten year old doesn't necessarily necessarily mean you're going to make it. Um, and I've I've had a lot of my friends that I think, oh, what a player he was, but due to not being overly committed. And maybe um, socially always going out, it, you know they, they do fall by the wayside, don't they? Yeah, they do, and, and a lot of players. Like they, like you'll go and watch um, some non-league games, and you how is he not playing in the league? Yeah. How is he not playing yeah. higher? But there's reasons why they're not. You know, there's yeah. reasons why not. Some just get get missed. Yeah. For whatever reasons they get missed, but. There's a reason why they're not, and like like I just said, the, the commitment and the sacrifice is massive if you want to be a professional footballer. Yeah, I've just got another question here. I think this is quite a good one from Luke Hewitt. Um, he goes, "Sorry to bring this up, Doogie." He goes, "But who helped you uh, the most to get over your penalty miss at Wembley? Um, <laughs> and uh, what what advice did you receive?" Um, Not being able to do this. The boys helped me a lot, a lot. Yeah. Uh, people like Pete Crawley was fantastic. Obviously, he missed the penalty as well, but Pete was unbelievable. Yeah. Abe's, Abe's was fantastic, brilliant with me. I've got, a, I've got a real good photo of Abe's holding me up, sort of thing, and cuddling me after it yeah. happened. Um, but it became like it, it helped make me, if I'm honest. Yeah. I remember getting back to the hotel because we had a mid after we went into London, we had a hotel, the, the chairman of the were sort of like an after, not an after party because we didn't win, but yeah. uh, went there and it was just nice, you know, and I got there and the first thing there was, it was a telegram, you know, that's how many years ago it was, there's a yeah. telegram on the, uh, on the, my table, on my plate where I was sitting, I was thinking, who's that from? And it was from Steve Foley. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and he was at Norwich at the time. Yeah. So he obviously saw the game, and it, all it said was, "At least you had the balls to take one." Hundred percent. That was it. that was it. I mean, yeah. I was eighteen at the time. I think I was eighteen at the time. Yeah. Um, all it said was, "At least you had the balls to take one," and that was it. And love that it made me stronger as a person, as a footballer. Yeah. I, and yeah, I got a stick for it, but it was, I mean, I think they'd done a phone in on SGR at the time about what would we do to help Cole Doogie out and stuff like yeah. that. But it was great, you know, look, it was, like I say, the players and the management team were, were brilliant at the time. Like I say, Abe's and Pete Crawley were probably the, the, the main two that sort of, I mean, as well, Tony Locke and Mickey Hayden, they were all fantastic for me. Yeah. Well, dudes, listen, mate, I really appreciate you, uh, you doing this, our, our first ever SES podcast. Um, obviously, as we go along and do different podcasts, I'd love you to be involved in that as well. Um, no. 
between both of us, our, our contacts. Um, I want to say a massive thank you as well to Lee from Happy Days, um, who's been non-stop with me and Carl, uh, setting this up um, for us guys, who's, who's our, one of our partners with the company. Um, so yeah, just to finish off, dudes, really appreciate it, mate. Top, top pro. Um, thanks a lot for obviously answering all the different questions. And uh, we'll speak soon, but all right. No worries. Top, mate. Okay, stay Bye. safe, you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.